there's so much life in this place already. I want to invite you to stand. We're going to start worshiping. Would you just bless someone around you? And we'll get going.
the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are this again. Is God good tonight? Come on. Is God good tonight? Yes. You are good. You're good. Oh. Come on, you sing it. You are
children, God. And we worship you tonight. We give you praise. We give you glory for who you are. You're a miracle maker, wonder working God. We worship you. I worship you. I worship you, God. Come on, worship him with your own words. Just say, worship you, Jesus. You deserve all the praise, all the glory. Worship you, Lord. Yes, Lord. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Working in this place, I worship you. I worship you. Sing that again. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. You are here, working in this. Sing tonight, we make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We believe that tonight he's the way maker in this room. We make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, you are here. Touching every Turning lives around, oh yeah. 
declare this together in one voice, we make her. We make miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. The bridge goes like this. Even when I don't see you. We praise you. We honor you, God. Thank you that you're in this place and that you're doing miracles right now, God. We believe it. You're working among us. You're moving in the room through the aisles, God. You're touching hearts, touching lives, restoring. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you tonight. Can we thank you one more time? We believe that he is working in this place. Amen. Before we move to the next part, I wanted to tell you quickly, someone sent me an email recently and said, Pav, you know, who are all those people that are singing with you? Can you tell us? Like, every week there's someone else. Well, I thought, well, why not bring them all up and just have them here? I can't tell you all their names because there are quite a few. But can we give it up for our PCC singers here? They're just so awesome. And that's just half of them, you know. The other half is all over the place. But I'm just so thankful to worship with every one of you and just want to say we love the Lord in this place. We believe that he's moving and we believe that he's here right now. Amen? Amen. Pastor Dan, would you come up? I'm gone for one week, and he's taken over the platform. Do you see that? Do you see that? It's all right. It's all, it's all right. It's all right. Thank you so much. I want to just thank you for leading us. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm not surprised. I didn't get a memo. Did any of you not get a memo to join the... Uh, they didn't ask me to sing. I feel just a little bit bad. You can be seated, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming, guys. You didn't get the memo about wearing your pajamas tonight? You know, we just had a marvelous time in India, and you can talk to any one of the five pastors that went. We got home on Wednesday. I think I've been sleeping for two days since then. It was just great. I'm wearing this, I think it's called a kunta, something like that. It covers all the Indian food that I ate. It was amazing how much we ate. And God has not moved. You know, it's just amazing. You, you think you're going to go to another country and bring God, and he's already there. And what he was doing in that country is amazing. And we continue to just pray for our brothers and sisters there. And so I just encourage, if you want to pull one of the pastors aside and just say, give me your three-minute story, they'll do that for you. Three minutes that changed their life. And we just love to do that. 
Um, tonight, I want to welcome some special guests. Um, oh, we're going to send the children away, all the children. I think they already left. They go downstairs and have fun. Um, tonight, I just want to welcome you back. A lot of you had a long summer, a short summer for many of us. It's too quick, wasn't it? And we welcome you back here to Plymouth Covenant. We're going to have our just wonderful launch this weekend of many of our programs. Uh, I want to just welcome a special guest. Where's Matt and Shannon? They're here somewhere? Over, over here somewhere? We have a baby in the house for the first time, and I'm kind of a grandparent because I married them a few years ago, so let's just meet Dylan over here. Is he, like, sleeping? Oh, yeah. oh look at that. He's got a little, little kangaroo outfit on or something. What is it? So tell us how big he was, Shannon. Eight pounds, one ounce. Oh, that's a keeper for any size of fish. That's awesome. So, <laughs> so man. Did you turn this off? Oh, there we go. Can I pray for you guys? God, I thank you so much for this couple and this gift of life. Little Dylan is yours, God, and we give him back to you. We ask that you might just use this little boy to draw all of us to Jesus, God. Might you remind us of your son. Might he grow up to be like Jesus. That's our prayer. For Shannon and Matt, I pray that they might sleep some, <laughs> that they might enjoy this little boy, watch him grow, and give him back to you every day. In Jesus' name. We're going to invite the ushers to come at this time as we take our offering. If you're visiting with us tonight, just pass the old offering plate by. But I would ask you to give thanks to God. God is moving in amazing ways, and don't take that for granted. As a part of your offering, just say, thank you, God, for this, and then thank you. Let's pray together. God, I am so grateful for all that you've provided, from little, little babies to old friends, to gathering here tonight in the freedom of this place the opportunity to hear about manhood and what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I thank you so much for this great country, but God, I'm so grateful that you're in this place as a miracle worker, that you are the light of the world tonight. Shine brightly to us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you look at the next slide, you'll notice lots of things happening in our church. Many things, too many to count. If you'll notice, there's something for every age group. Do you see that? From children, middle school, senior high, young adults, women, men, marriage, and adults. And if you're in one of those categories, which I hope you are, or else it means you're dead, okay, and, and uh, take one of those categories and say, this is what I'm going to do this year, and I'm going to join in. You can find more on our webpage. There's some in your bulletin today. Lots of things happen. If you have questions about any of these, you can go to the hub, and if you're a visitor, they have a gift for you we'd love to give to you, and we'd love to do that. Turn to the next slide if you don't mind. Tomorrow, we have one of our favorite events. It's called Taste of PCC. It's going to be in our church parking lot. If it rains, we're still going to have it probably be inside. But it's just an opportunity to enjoy what people make and enjoy the fellowship together. And, and I just encourage you to come tomorrow night. There's games for the kids from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock. Be with us. And then as well, I want to point out that next week, we're going to encourage more people to come on Saturday night. We call it the Saturday Shift, and I'm already preaching to the choir here. Many of you are here. Some are here tonight for General Boykin, and I just want to say, you should probably come next week on Saturday night as well. We're having pie. Did you hear that? Pie. <laughs> and so join us next week. We have t-shirts for those who are committed to join us on Saturday night, so we'd love to have you do that next week. I'm beginning a series that's going to start, oh, I promised Darlene that I would share this with you. Um, we have Mark Men with Christ, and many of you have heard about that. Men here have attended that. It's changed our families, changed our lives. There's, there's a parallel program for women called Women's Walk with Christ, and it's usually filled, and they have some room this year, and, and it's actually on this weekend, October 4th. Go online, find out more about that. We'd love to have you join us. Do I have one more slide after that? That's it? Okay, I'll get it in there for you tomorrow, okay? Uh, we're going to invite Randy up. Is he going to introduce General Boykin? Well, tonight you might have noticed that uh, it's a little bit different, you know, and at the same, t at the same time it's kind of the same. Uh, so it's a Saturday night service, but it's a special Real Men, Real Issues uh, event tonight. So we're combining this service, and uh, Pav, you know, I just love Pav, you know, he, he just went all out just for the men's event tonight. You know, the choir and everything, you know, it's just for us. No, it's for all of us. And, uh, but tonight we have a special event, you know, with Real Men, Real Issues, and uh, we have uh, General Boykin, and I'm going to ask him to come on up. And uh, we're so excited to have him here. He's my new friend. Uh, just met him today, and uh, just really excited about um, uh, what he has to share with us, you know. So with Real Men, Real Issues, we, we love to bring in different speakers that will challenge us and encourage us as men to walk with Jesus. It's all about building stronger men for Jesus Christ. Well, General Jerry Boykin, um, he served in the U.S. Army for um, over uh, 36 years. 
Uh, he was a part of the original Delta Force and then also uh, commanded these elite warriors for a long time. And uh, so he also worked at the Pentagon and uh, led missions all over the world, you know, uh, for our country. But he's also uh, the executive vice president of the uh, Family uh, Research Council in Washington, D.C., and then also leads his own ministry uh, called Kingdom uh, Warriors. And it's all about encouraging Christians to live a bold faith and encourage them in their faith. He's also an ordained minister. So uh, tonight's topic is the five P's of manhood. And so uh, welcome. Glad Thank you're you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Randy. God bless you all. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. Is there anybody left in Plymouth? I mean, <laughs> looks to me, Pastor, like they're all here in your church tonight, but it's good to be with you. Let's establish the fact that I'm from the South, so we may have a language barrier here, and if we do, we got anybody from North Carolina or Virginia here that could, could you translate if there's any problems here this evening? Thank you very much. I would appreciate that. And, uh, I, uh, the largest veterans event that I have ever done, and I speak every Veterans Day to veterans in some place in this country, and the largest one I ever did was in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, at a big church over there. And I love veterans. I love people that have served this country. Let me see your hands if you've served America in the uniform of the U.S. military. There you go. Thank you for your service. Thank you all. Do we have any Marines in here? <laughs> now, what do you think that was? That is what they call the Marine Corps mating call. Okay? No, I love you Marines. Let me tell you a story about Marines. So this Marine, he goes into a Walmart and he goes back into the appliance section and he goes up to the clerk back there and he says, excuse me, sir. He says, I want to buy that TV right there. Well, he had on his blue uniform, these nice looking uniforms they had, and the clerk said to him, I will not sell that to a Marine. He said, well, you can't do that. That's not, that's discriminant. I'll have your job. He went home, he thought about it a little while, and he thought, I really want that TV. So he put on his civilian clothes, pulled his ball cap down real tight over his ears, and walked back in. Same clerk, he walked up to him, he said, excuse me, sir, I want to buy that TV right there. The clerk said, I already told you I won't sell that to a Marine. And he said, that's it. You're fired. I'm going to get you. I'm going to, I, I promise you I'll have you. That was Friday night. He went home. He thought, what am I going to do? I really want that TV. Next morning, he got up and he said, well, maybe there'll be a different clerk in there. Put on his civilian clothes, pulled his ball cap down real tight on his ears, and he went back in and there was a woman in there. He walked up to her and he said, excuse me, ma'am. I want to buy that TV right there. And she said, I won't sell that to a Marine. And he said, well, first of all, how do you even know that I'm a Marine? And she said, because that's a microwave. <laughs> Just this week, I turned in my... Uh, manuscript for my next book, which is the topic of what I'm going to talk to you about tonight. I, tomorrow morning, I'm actually going to talk to the two services directly from my autobiography here about my years in the Delta Force and, and some of the operations that we ran around the world. And, and uh, so I hope uh, that some of you will join us for that tomorrow morning. And I'm, uh, I'm going to go through what I call the five P's of manhood. My new book, uh, we started out with that as the title of my new book, and then we found out that there was already a five P's book. So we've changed the title of it to Man to Man, Rediscovering Masculinity in a Confused World. Masculinity. Masculinity is under attack in this nation today. Have you noticed? When the University of Texas Department of Psychology declares that masculinity is a mental disorder, we've got a problem. When Brown University is teaching classes on how to overcome toxic masculinity, we've got a problem. When 72% of the 
black babies born today are born into homes where there's no father. The father and the mother are not married. They're not together. We have a problem. Masculinity is being denigrated. Masculinity is being ridiculed. And men are confused about what they're supposed to be. So I'm going to break it down to you. And I've got to go through this quickly. Speaking fast is not part of my DNA because I'm from the South. But I'm going to try to speak fast tonight so I can get through this in the allotted amount of time here. But men, the first P is you're the protector. You have a biblical mandate to be a protector. You know, uh, I, I am really disturbed by what I see today when you will see a woman being abused and men will walk by it and pretend that they don't see it, that it's not happening. You see, you're the protector not only of your home, of your family, but you're the protector of those who cannot protect themselves. You're a protector of the weak, the innocent. You have to protect people. You have to protect those people that you care about. And as a Christian man, you should care about all people, regardless of who they are, regardless of their race, their creed, their color, their nationality. In 2017, I was driving down Interstate 95 right before Christmas, or it, actually right before uh, Thanksgiving. I was going down 95, and I looked over on the side of the road as I'm running down there about 80 miles an hour down 95, which is a little bit over the speed limit. And I saw a car on the side of the road, and there was a man out there that had a woman by the hair, and he was slinging her around like this, and he slammed her down on the side of the road, on the side of the interstate, and he kicked her. And then he fell down on her, and he beat her. I whipped off the interstate as quickly as I could, and I reached over and grabbed my Kimber M1911 45 caliber pistol, and I went running down the highway to get to him to stop him. And the whole time I'm thinking... Am I going to shoot him? Or am I going to try to hit him up beside the head with this thing? And then as, as your mind is working at warp speed, I'm thinking I'd rather stand before a judge than to let him kill this woman. Well, by the time I got down there and got that 45 in his face, he, he changed his mind about what he was doing. What's the point? You can't go by a situation like that. You're a man. You can't go by a situation like that and not do something. You can't, you, you've got to protect the women that God has put on this earth and the innocent because you're a man and that's your responsibility to protect it. But we also have to protect our families from the evil that comes into our homes. Do you realize how much evil comes in on the Airways on that television set. Do you know how much evil comes in on the computer? If you don't have a block, man, on your computer to where your children or anybody in your home can't get on that computer and get into pornography, you, you need to rethink that. Josh McDowell says that 74% of the families in the church today have somebody in that family that's addicted to pornography. You as the man in that family, first of all, if you're one of those that is addicted, get help and get out of it. Get out of it as quickly as you possibly can because you can't protect your children and your family if you're addicted yourself. Get out of it and protect them from the video games. Look at these video games they're playing. I'm not saying they're all bad, but I'm saying a lot of them are. A lot of them are designed to, to dement your mind. Look at these video games that are being played in your home. Keep the evil out of your home and then protect them from predators. Let me tell you something, dads, fathers, grandfathers, grandfathers, you listen to me. If, you're, if there's a school teacher that just doesn't seem right to you, your instinct says there's something wrong with this school teacher, you follow your instincts and, and investigate a little further. Or the youth minister. Or the local good guy in the neighborhood that always has candy for the children. If your instinct tells you that there's something wrong with that, you better pay attention to your instincts. My son is a polygrapher. 
for the Secret Service. He's been a Secret Service agent for about 16 years, and now he does polygraphs. And he said, Dad, you will not believe what these men admit to when they come in and they take this polygraph. He asked them hard questions. And he said, Dad, it's, it scares me. He said, I'm afraid right now for my little nine-year-old son. He said, I'm afraid to even leave him with a babysitter because of what these men are confessing to. You protect your children and your grandchildren from predators. You are the protector. And then never, never walk by a situation where a woman is being abused and don't do something. There are worse things in life than getting kicked around a little bit because you're trying to do the right thing and help somebody else. And when, even when you're not at home, you have to protect your home. I'm going a lot. I travel a lot. My wife, I'm from the South now. I'm going to say it again. My wife was a pistol-packing mama. <laughs> She's got two pistols with her all the time, and no matter where we go. She got two pistols. In fact, one time she had one in her back pocket, and she was at the book table, and she bent over, and some guy came up to me, and she was picking up some more boxes. He said, Sir, your wife just bent over, and I thought, I'm about to slap you. <laughs> and he said, She's got a pistol in her back pocket. And I said, And she's got another one in her backpack. But I looked the other day, and, and I'm going a lot. We got the best alarm system money can buy. But you know what? She's got five guns in the bedroom and a dog with a nasty attitude. <laughs> I call before I come home late. Okay? You have to protect those that you're responsible for and those that are unable to protect themselves. You are the protector. Secondly, you're the provider. It's more than just providing the f financial needs of the family. You know, thanks largely to Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the New Deal, we, we actually have developed a system that makes it more profitable in some cases for men not to work. And what's that doing to them? What's it doing to them? It's robbing them of their dignity. We are robbing men of their dignity because of the system that makes it more profitable not to work. You know, there comes a time when, as a provider, you know, we reach retirement age and we, we go into retirement and we, we can enjoy the fruits of our labor or we're disability, you know, we have a disability. And especially wounded veterans, you know, I, I know so many wounded veterans, you know, that are just not capable of going out and working outside of the home. But I'm talking to able-bodied men. You have to provide for the financial needs of the family, but you provide more than that. You provide direction to the family. Direction. Joshua led the Israeli or the Jewish tribal elders out into the desert in the 24th chapter of Joshua. He had conquered the promised land. And now he led them out into the desert, and he preached his own epitaph. He reviewed the history with them. But then he said this to them. He said, choose you this day which God you will serve, whether it's the God of the fathers, that the God they worshiped on the other side of the Euphrates River, or it's the God of the Amorites in whose land you stand today. But as for me and my house... We will serve the Lord. The Father provides direction. That's exactly what Joshua was doing as he stood in the desert that day. As for me and my house. He was talking about his posterity for generations to come. We will serve the Lord. A man provides direction to the family. A man also provides identity. My father did not have a high school education. He went off to World War II when he was 17 years old. But as we would drive the 80 miles from our home in New Bern, North Carolina, to my grandmother's house in Wilson, North Carolina, all 80 miles of that, he would be telling me about who I was. He would be telling me about my great-grandfather and his grandfather. 
and he would be telling me about people on both sides of the family so that I had an identity. I knew where I came from. I knew who I was. I didn't pay much attention to those books and numbers where you get so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so That was like watching paint dry to me until five years ago as I watched my wife, who was adopted at nine weeks old, and she had such a deep passion to know who she was. She wanted so much to have an identity. And you know, you don't think about it when you know where you came from. You know who your family is. But she didn't have that. She had been raised by people that adopted her. And she wanted to know who she was. And finally, as a result of ancestry, and, and, and really four years of hard work, she found her family. Let me tell you, they're wonderful Christian people. And it's been the greatest blessing next to Mary and me. The greatest blessing. <laughs> well, that wasn't a, supposed to be funny. It's been the greatest blessing. And I watched. It, it brought tears to my eyes as I watched her go through this process of knowing who she was. You know, the whole book of Deuteronomy. What, what I mean, think about it. What was Moses doing? He was teaching them the history of the Jewish people because most of those Jews that he was teaching were not there when the Red Sea parted. They were not there when manna fell from the skies. And he knew that they had to have an identity by knowing where they came from, what their history was. And then finally, you provide the values. And to provide values, you've got to have a transcendent cause. You've got to Without question, you have to have something in your life that's worth living for, it's worth sacrificing for, and, and God forbid, worth dying for. I'll tell you about it more tomorrow, but, you know, I commanded the Delta Force during the events that you know as Black Hawk Down. I was the commander on the ground there. And you know what we were fighting for? 18-hour battle in that city in Mogadishu, Somalia. We fought 18 hours. You know what we were fighting over? The bodies of two of our comrades. We stayed in that city for 18 hours because we couldn't get their bodies out of that Black Hawk that crashed. And we lost more people fighting to get those bodies because our transcendent cause was a commitment that we had made to each other. And it's encapsulated in what we call the fifth stanza of the Ranger Creed. And it says, never will I leave a fallen comrade to fall into the hands of the enemy. And we lived by that. You see, it was a transcendent cause. It wasn't the Constitution. I love the Constitution. I served 36 and a half years. But at that time, it was about our comrades. That transcendent cause that kept us in that city for 18 hours, losing more people, taking more wounded. Because we were not going to walk out of there and leave those men behind. It was a transcendent cause. For you to be a provider, you have to be a trans have a transcendent cause. And then the third P is you're the professor. And let me say, first of all, to be the professor or the teacher or the instructor, you need to know the Word of God. You need to know the Word of God. And one of the major problems in the church today across this country, across the world, is that people don't read the Bible. People don't know the Word of God. They can quote a few scriptures because they've heard them so many times, but they don't read the Bible. And you may say, well, I'm not much of a reader. Well, this is what I say to you. Get over it. Get over it. You need to read. But even if you can't, if you're dyslexic or you have trouble reading, get the Bible on tape. And when you're driving somewhere, instead of listening to music, listen to the word. Faith cometh by hearing. And know what the Bible says? Is that what it says, Pastor? So get the Bible on tape, but you got to know the word because you're the teacher, you're the professor in the family. You got to know current events. And I know a lot of you say, I don't even watch the news anymore. It's so depressing. That's not a good answer. You got to watch the news. You got to know what's going on. You don't have to watch CNN or MSNBC or Fox News. And I do Fox News more than any other program on it. In fact, CNN doesn't even invite me anymore. <laughs> Hurt my feelings so much. <laughs> but Fox does. 
But look, you're not getting everything from those networks. Find you some alternate sources, and a lot of it is online, and there are good websites. There are good daily publications that will tell you what's going on in the, in the world, not just in this country. But as a professor, you've got to be able to explain things. You've got to be able to explain what's going on. You've got to be able to look at events that are unfolding in different parts of the world like North Africa, like the southern littorals of Europe, like the Middle East. And you've got to be able to say, I see Ezekiel 38 and 39 for me. Oh, I don't know when that battle is going to take place. Nobody does, but we can at least look at it. Read Ezekiel 38 and 39 and look at what's happening in that part of the world. And you say, wow, it looks like it's coming together. But you've got to be able to look at the things that are occurring today and put them in the context of biblical prophecy or the teachings of the Bible. And you've got to know the Word in order to do that. And you've got to know history and listen one of the big things that I, I, I am really worried about today is that we're losing our history because it's either not being taught in the public schools or it's, it's an altered history. Now, let me tell you something. I taught at a college level when I got out of the Army for 10 years. And after the first night's three-hour class, I could tell you who was homeschooled or was a product of a Christian school. And I could tell you, conversely, who was in a public school. And the difference was, the dividing line was, those that were homeschooled, those that went to a Christian school knew history, knew American history, knew true, authentic American history. You've got to know history. I, sit, I lay down at night, I read my Bible first, and then I read a history book. I read history every night. And then, as the professor, as the teacher... Teach your sons how to treat a woman. How do you do that? How do you do it? They watch how you treat their mother. The greatest compliment that you can ever have as a man is for your daughter to say, I want to marry a man just like my dad. There's no greater compliment coming from one of your, your daughters. Because she's seen how you treat her mother. Teach your, your sons how to treat women. And then also, I want to say to you, don't be afraid to let them endure hardship. My son that's in the Secret Service went through the Army Ranger program in 1997. He went through the worst class that they had had in 40 years. They started with 220 people, and they ended with about 42 of the original ones that started because it was the worst weather. They had snow in the mountains, and it was just a miserable winter. And we were sitting around a fire in Alaska one night, and we were talking about his ranger class, and I said, I said, son, I was really proud of you when you made it through that. And he said, Dad, you know why I made it? I said, well, you're a tough guy. He said, no, Dad. He said, you remember all those mornings you used to wake me up at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning and take me out there in a duck blind and I'd sit there and shiver with those old Walmart boots on my feet? <laughs> yeah, son, I'm sorry. He said, Dad, you remember those mornings you'd get me up and take me out there and you'd put me up in a tree stand and I'd sit there from before dark till after dark waiting for a deer to come by and I'd shiver the whole time. Yeah, son, I'm sorry. No, Dad, you're not getting it, he said. He said, that's why I made it. Because I'd endured hardship. He said, those men in my class had never endured hardship. They'd never been cold or miserable. He said, I had, and I knew that it was only temporary. I knew I could get through it. Don't be afraid to let your children endure some hardship. My son was driving in Washington, D.C. one night, speeding, and I had a pistol in the car that he was driving, and he got arrested, and they took my pistol and locked him up, and they called me, and I said, what'd you get him for? He said he was speeding, and we got a pistol in the car, and I said, well, tell him to have a good evening. <laughs> you say, well, that's awfully hard. Yeah, it is hard, but there's got to be some consequences. Don't be afraid. Don't bail them out of everything, dads. 
Let them endure hardship. The fourth P is you're the pal. You're not a pal to your children. There, there will come a time when you'll be their pal. My boys and I, we are best of friends now. We go off on forays. We go to Alaska every summer. We go to Idaho in the fall for mule deer hunting. We go to West Virginia for trout fishing in the spring. We take off on these father-son forays. But that wasn't that way when they were growing up because I had to discipline them and I had to make the tough calls in their lives. But a man needs a, a pal. You need a, a battle buddy. You see, in the Army and the Marine Corps, we call them battle buddies. The Navy calls them shipmates. The Air Force calls them wingmen. We call them battle buddies. And it's a man that you can trust. It's a man that you can be intimate with in terms of telling him what you're afraid of, what you're struggling with. And by the way, men, I want to just say this to you. I am absolutely no different than you are. First of all, I'm not religious because I grew up in such a, a, a spirit of religiosity that everything that looked good, sounded good, smelled good, tasted good, or felt good was a sin. Everything. And I walked away from the church until God gave me an opportunity to come back and serve him. I've struggled the same way you have. I'm no different than you are, but I am redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ because I've confessed my sins and I've, I've pledged to try every day to do better than I did yesterday. Sometimes I succeed and sometimes I don't, but you need a battle buddy that you can go to and you can share things with. You know what? Let me tell you a story about a, a guy named Frank Brewer. He's a Marine helicopter pilot. And in 1982, he found himself in the Armed Forces Staff College with a, an Army buddy that grew up only 35 miles from him. And they were instant friends, and they spent the whole year in the Staff College doing things together because they were from the same area. And then after the Staff College graduated in 1983, they... They came back to uh, and had vacation together. Their families had vacation together. And then Frank told his army buddy, he said, uh, he said man, I got to go to Beirut, but I'll see you after the first of the year. I'll be back from Beirut. And Frank's ship was sailing to Beirut in October of 1983 when all of a sudden Ronald Reagan ordered them to go and position themselves off the coast of a little Caribbean island called Grenada. Where the Cubans and the Russians were building an airfield down there that would put Russian MiGs and Russian bombers within range of the United States. And Ronald Reagan said, not in my hemisphere, not on my watch. You won't do this. And he sent U.S. forces down there. On the morning of the 24th of October, the Marines that Frank Brewer was with all loaded up on helicopters and took off and went and raided an airfield and took that airfield down. And because Frank was the executive officer of that squadron, he was left on board with one maintenance officer. And all of a sudden there was a net call. We need a medevac, medevac, medevac. We got a man that's expectant. Expect it means we expect him to die unless he gets a medevac very quickly and gets to medical attention. Medevac, medevac, medevac. Frank looked at his maintenance officer. He said, do we have anything left? His maintenance officer said, no, nothing. He said, nothing? He said, well, we got the old hangar queen sitting back here in the hangar, but it's in maintenance. And he said, will it fly? The maintenance officer said, oh, you, you get in trouble if you fly. Will it fly, Frank said. Yeah, it'll fly, but you'll get in trouble if you fly. I'll fly it. You get in as a co-pilot. I'll take the responsibility. We got a man that's dying, 
and we need to go get him. Frank jumped in that helicopter, fired it up, and he went to the coordinates that he was given. As he looked out the window of his helicopter, he saw the man on that stretcher was his buddy, his army buddy. They brought him on board his helicopter and Frank saved his life by getting him to medical care. Battle buddies. You see, the man on that stretcher was me. I'd been hit with a 50 caliber and I was fading in and out. But I was saying, God, have you forsaken me? God, have you forsaken me? God, where are you? As I faded in and out of consciousness. But when I looked up, saw him hanging out of the window giving me a thumbs up I saw my battle buddy he didn't know he was going to pick me up I didn't know he was coming to pick me up but God honors that relationship between men as iron sharpens iron so one man sharpeneth another you need that kind of man in your life I've got two other battle buddies one is Stu Weber, who used to be with Promise Keepers, he's a Green Beret in Vietnam, and another one is a guy out in Colorado. God speaks to me through them. But they're always there when I need them. No matter what, they're always there. You need that kind of battle buddy, and you need a battle, you need to be a battle buddy to somebody like that. Because as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Joshua and Caleb. Battle buddies. Battle buddies. They were the only two out of that group of 12 that came back and gave a report that said, yes, Lord, uh, Moses, all these things that, that they say is true, but God promised us this land. We can take them. Let's go. And because Moses listened to the, mon- the majority report, they wandered around in the desert for 40 years. And Joshua and Caleb were the only ones that survived that to actually see that promised land, that covenant land. And then after they'd conquered it, they sat around a fire one night and, and Caleb reflected with his battle buddy as they sat around that fire. He reflected on, he said, 40 years ago, I spoke as it was in my heart. But then he said, and I'm the same man today I was in. Give me the hill country, the toughest. Give me the hill country. Battle buddies. They trusted each other. That's what you've got to have in your life. The disciples went out in pairs. You need a battle buddy. And that takes a lot of investment in building that kind of relationship. But don't underestimate your need to be a pal, to have a battle buddy. And then finally, the last P is you're the priest of the family. You're the priest of the family. You are the spiritual head of the family. Now listen, that does not mean because you're the spiritual head. That is biblical. It does not mean that you make all the decisions in the family. It doesn't mean you don't share the responsibilities with your wife. In fact, I have not written a check in 21 years. That's the truth. My wife, I don't know if I have any money or not. I, that, I'm telling you the honest truth. I have no idea. We went to see a, I, I, I did get a window because we went to see a, a broker the other day, about two months ago actually. And I found out, well, I actually do have some money. But that, I'm telling you, I come home some days and I don't even know if I'm in the right house because nothing is the same. (laughs) And I'll come in and I'll say, oh, you got new furniture? Yeah, I sure did. Do you like it? And it ain't but one right answer. (laughs) 
it's lovely, baby. But I'm still the spiritual head. You know, when I, my grandchildren come during the holidays, they hear me pray. Grandpa, they hear Grandpa pray over the meals. When they come at Christmas, they hear Grandpa read the Christmas story at Easter. The death and resurrection of Jesus, they hear Grandpa because I want them to remember me as a spiritual man. I want them to see me pray. Dads, let them see you pray. Say, well, I don't know how to pray. You know how to talk? <laughs> Trust me. The Pharisees prayed these long, elaborate prayers. But they weren't praying to God. They were praying for people around them. And I tell the story in one of my books about the 10-second prayer. As I stood in the desert of Iran one night, I was one of those people that went in in 1980 to try and rescue the 52 Americans that were being held there. And we had a huge explosion in about 100 miles from Tehran in the desert there. And as I looked on that fire, as it was, it was burning this airplane up, I realized that 45 of our men, our, our Delta Force men, were in that fire. I'll tell you more about it tomorrow, but I just stood, and I couldn't go in that fire and get them out, but I stood in 10 seconds. I said, Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking you to spare these men. Lord, they trusted you. Bring them out alive in Jesus' name. I mean, 10 seconds. 10-second prayer, but it was pray from the heart. The Bible says, you'll seek me and find me when you seek me with what? All your heart. Power of a 10 -second. Let them see you pray. Dads, let them see you pray. Let your kids, let your grandkids see you pray. Lead the prayers. Be ready in season and out of season because you're the spiritual head. And one of the things that you have to do as the priest of the family is you have to give your children and your wife a father's blessing. You know, in the book of Genesis, the very first thing that God did after he created man was he blessed them, didn't he, Pastor? He blessed them. God blessed them. Isaac blessed Jacob. Jacob blessed his grandsons. The father's blessing is so powerful. I was speaking in Chicago one time, and somebody had paid for about uh, 30 young black boys out of a, a really bad neighborhood there to come to this, to hear it, it, this, you know, this conference I was putting on. And I took them, I took those boys into a separate room for an hour and a half, and I, I, uh, I began to minister to them. And there was one little boy in there that just, God drew me to him. And as he walked out, I said, come here, son. I said, I know you won't understand this, but, but God's got an anointing on you. He has a purpose in your life, and you need to be seeking the Lord to find out what he wants to do with your life. And he walked on out. He didn't say anything. A little while later, he came to my book table, and he said, can I talk to you? I walked outside with him, and he said, he said, sir, my, my name is DeAndrea, and I don't know who my father is, and my mother's in prison, so I only see her four times a year. I live with my grandmother, but he said, I'm thinking about committing suicide. He said, I'm thinking about committing suicide. I said, son, come on. I said, you come back in the sanctuary with me. Come back in here. And I got him up in front of me, and I just, at the altar there, I laid my hands on him, and I began to bless him. And then I said, when I got finished blessing him, we were both in tears. And I said, I need somebody to mentor him. Now, somebody come along beside him and mentor him, and nobody would raise their hand. And I knew what it was. Nobody wanted to go in in the neighborhood. And finally, a, a white man said, I'll do it. He had his son with him, and I said, come on up here. And we got them hooked up. And he started mentoring DeAndrea, who was going to commit suicide. 
because the gangs in his neighborhood were after him. We, you don't understand that we have a generation of young men that have never been blessed by their father because they don't know who their father is or their father left and they have no relationship with their father. My father came to Christ late in life. When he came to Christ, he was so fanatical. As a matter of fact, the hospital chaplain wouldn't even come in his room anymore because he was trying to get the chaplain saved. <laughs> and that's no joke. But he never blessed me. He didn't know. I was speaking in Katy, Texas one night. I just I told Pastor Randy this earlier tonight. And there were several thousand men there at an outdoor men's conference. And I said, men, my father never blessed me. And that's one of my, my great regrets is that my father never blessed me. But I said, you bring your sons up here and you, you're going to bless your sons tonight. Bring your sons up here. And they started coming up. And there was a, I saw this uh, very muscular black man coming right straight towards me. And I thought, what? But, but you could tell by his countenance that he was, he was being led by the Holy Spirit. And he came up to me and he said, my name is Pastor Charles Flowers. He said, I'm from San Antonio. And he said, if you'll let me, he said, I'll bless you on behalf of your deceased father. I'll affirm you as a man, as a man of faith, as a man in whom God is greatly pleased. I lost it. I stood there as he laid his hands on me and began to bless me and affirm me. And I got to tell you, it's one of the most, most emotional things that's ever happened to me. And since then, I've ended every men's conference by asking the men to bring their children to the altar here and lay your hands on them as we pray a blessing over them. Would you do that right now if you have a son or a daughter here, a spiritual son or daughter, if you have them here with you? I know the children left, but some of you have adult children here. Would you bring them up here right now? Come on. Come on. Bring your sons, your daughters. Bring them up here. There you go. Look at this precious little girl. I'm going to bring him up here. Come on. Thanks, guys. Come on. Let's go bring your sons and daughters up here. Oh, look at this. My goodness. Come on. Come on. Coming out of the balcony. Come on up here. Get in the aisles as best you can here. You stand before God today and you will bless your children. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for these children. Thank you, Lord. Now I want you to take your hands, and if you have multiple children here, lay your hands on If you're the grandfather, and you got your son and your grandson, dad, while he's blessing you, you, you bless your children. Lay your hands on them, and now begin to bless them as I pray a blessing over all of you. Father, we thank you for these children, and we ask you, Lord, to... Let your anointing be upon them. We bless you. We affirm you as a man, as a woman, as someone that God is greatly pleased with because he created you. We have great hopes for you. We just ask God that your blessings will be upon them, that they will make the right decisions in life, and God, that they will hear your voice when they arise in the mornings that they will hear your voice as we bless them. We bless you right now. 
We bless you and declare that God has a purpose in your life. We bless you because God has raised you up for such a time as this. We bless you because you are our offspring. And we love you. And God gave us you as a special gift. And now we bless you and we affirm you and we thank you, God, for these children, for these offspring. Thank you so much, God. For you're an awesome God. And now may you go with God's blessings upon your life and do what God has called you to do. In Jesus' name, amen. And now you can go back to your seats. I'm going to ask you a question here, and I just want to see a show of hands. Are there men in here tonight that have never had a Father's blessing that what you want your pastor and your elders of this church to give you a Father's blessing tonight? Come on up here. Come on up here. Pastor, would, would you bring the elders of the church up here? These are men of authority. And if you want a father's blessing tonight, you want to be affirmed as a man, these elders, this pastor are here to do just that for you. So if you want that blessing, as I stood in Katy, Texas and had this pastor lay his hands on me and bless me. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've never made a commitment to him, and I ask you to come up here tonight and let me or one of these people pray a prayer of salvation with you. And I stand ready to do that. Now, let's pray the Father's blessing over these men. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I bless you. You are a man, and God is greatly pleased with you. You are not a man without flaws, but you're a man that God has his eye on. And now we bless you as a man, as a man that God wants to use to do great things, as a man that God has raised up for such a time as this. I bless you in the name of Jesus. I bless you as a man. Oh, I bless you as a man that God will use to tear down strongholds. A man that God will use to do great things in the kingdom. A man that will influence others to choose the right path. Jesus' name. Jesus' name, I bless you. I affirm you as a man. You are a man. You've been searching for what God wants to do with you. You've been looking to see which way God wants you to go. In Jesus' name, now I just ask that you'll have clarity because you are a man that God is wants to use. God has a purpose for you. You're a man that God has raised up. I bless you with a father's blessing because your father is in heaven. And your father looks down every day. Calling out to you. In Jesus' name. bless you in the name of Jesus I give you the father's blessing I give you the affirmation of a man God loves you 
God loves you. God wants you to know that he loves you and has a purpose in your life. In the name of Jesus, I affirm you in Jesus' name. my brother in Jesus name bless him God bless my brother in Jesus name Lord in Jesus name is anybody here that has not had a blessing It's a very special moment as the pastors and the elders are blessing these men. It's a very special thing that they're doing. can go back to your seats. Thank you. Amen. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Let's give God a clap offering, okay? It's been my privilege to be with you. I'm going to join you in just a little while for question and answers. You men that want to come and join us with, with that. I'll be at the book table for a few minutes if you want to get a book. They're already signed, but if you want me to personalize it for you, I'll put your name in it. So thank you for your patience tonight, for your attention, and I'll see you, some of you at least, tomorrow morning. God bless you, and God bless America. What an amazing gift that we just received tonight, and so, uh, and a great challenge to all of us.
So uh, we're going to dismiss you in just a moment here, and uh, but I'm going to ask all the men, please stay, join us. Uh, we have pizza and snacks uh, over in the cafe, and then we're going to have a question and answer time with uh, General Boykin. So love to have you uh, join us for that um, until 8.30. And then uh, anyone else that would like to uh, purchase a book or uh, talk to General Boykin uh, before we get started, please go out in the foyer and do that. And uh, let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, wow, what a blessing it was uh, to be challenged, me personally, and I know everyone here. Lord, I pray that you would continue to work in our hearts, Lord. I pray that we would be stronger men for you, stronger women, stronger children for you. Lord, we want to know you in a deeper way. So, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the work that you've started to do in our hearts tonight to draw us closer to you. Lord, thank you for the challenge. Thank you for the gift of General Boykin and uh, his passion and his love for you. And so, Lord Jesus, just uh, continue to work in our hearts. What do you have for us? Is there something more that you have for us? We pray this in your name. Amen. All right. Have a great night. Men, please join us uh, over in the cafe. See you in just a few minutes.